morning, I'm Daryl Jones, Director of Research at Hedgeye. Welcome to the Macro Show for Thursday, September 23rd. We're doing our Q4 themes presentation today. If you don't have access to that you can uh, and want access to it, you can email support at hedgeye.com and we can uh, get you in contact with the salesperson. Um, but before we get into the themes, we've got the morning to go through, and there's a lot of stuff happening this morning. The anti-contagion. The anti-contagion, yeah. Anti-contagion. Imagine on Monday what you did was you puked or you, you panicked or you sold, you know, which would all be part and parcel of the same thing. Uh, that is not how to do this, okay? So don't do that. I mean, you got so many people uh, that get paid uh, to, again, advertise through clickbait revenue for you to do that, and or just amateurs themselves just to help you do that uh, for themselves. You, of course, are on the other side of that wonderful buying opportunity uh, in this bull market. It was for both commodities and the parts of the equity markets that we like globally. So uh, we'll go through that indeed. Top three things this morning in my notebook for those of you that are joining us for the first time. Thank you. Uh, so I highlight, again, within a fractal model, again, a non-linear uh, but interconnected global macro model, what we're trying to focus on are the top three things that are moving in terms of moving the entirety of markets this morning. Um, so again, Asia is definitely number one, has been number one uh, for a while now. And then we're going to hit on the VIX, which is the volatility of the U.S. equity market. And then, of course, on the, what the bond market saw, which is absolutely nothing on Monday, by the way, uh, but you already knew that if you are a subscriber. Hey there, Hedgeye Nation, or if you're not part of Hedgeye Nation, thanks for watching Hedgeye on YouTube. If you haven't already, make sure to click on the button below there. Subscribe to our YouTube page. You can also follow the link in the description to our website to get even more great investing content. First on Asia. Okay, like I like to say, if you're bearish on China and you're worried about contagion, fucking short China, all right? We've been short China since, uh, obviously, the first quarter of this year. FXI and EWH are on the page. We added CHIQ, which is the Chinese consumer. So again, you don't have to sit there and tell yourselves narratives. You just made money on that against your European and U.S. equity longs. Again, on Monday, the call was cover those shorts, okay? Timing matters. Short selling's not easy. If it was, people that are calling for 10 to 12% corrections wouldn't be wrong on that and have to make a 20% correction from a much higher level. <laughs> That's tough. It's tough. It's tough. Short selling's tough, but get on the right side of the right markets, and covering is a real critical thing. For those of you that never shorted anything, covering is like buying. Um, so again, you're covering your shorts, booking gains. Nobody ever went broke booking gains. So again, I'll be happily uh, reshorting Hong Kong, all three of those ETFs, at the top end of the range, and we're not not even close to that yet in your risk range product. You can see where some of the proxies are. Uh, interestingly, Hong Kong, like I mean, talk about getting blasted. I mean, it crashed. It was down 22%. So if you if you were to make a 20% cr uh, plus correction or crash call, I prefer that you make it on something that actually does it. Accuracy matters. All right, uh, point number uh, two. And by the way, uh, in Asia, it's not just that. Within all the tells on the signals on non-contagion, again, we're not just trying to be uh, contrarian for contrarian's sake. We're trying to be right in P&L terms. Look at India. India didn't even flinch. Does that look like a global contagion to you? Very large place, lots of people, very close to China, closer than Connecticut. Okay, so that did that, of course. Um, you know, th that's a big signal in as much as our long Thailand position has gone up for three days in a row off the oversold signal as well. So what do you do today if you did all that? You sell some on the long side. That's what you do, okay? You, you sell on green, you buy the puke on red. Point number two this morning on the volatility of it all. So I ask you, and Jonesy did too. It was very nice of him to give me a compliment in the early look note this morning. He wrote it. He showed my timestamps. I mean, very simple question. You know, if you're going to follow old wall media and engage in this because it's free this morning, you know, what were you doing between about two o'clock and three o'clock in the afternoon on Monday? Hedge Eye Nation knows exactly what they did. All the timestamps are there, whether it was buying spies or industrials or stocks. You know, they're in real time alerts. That's why we timestamp things so we're not opining intellectually. Obviously, I'm not an intellectual. You know, I'm a practitioner. And, and, and the question is, at 28, 29 of the VIX, what were you doing? So again, when the VIX shoots above 31, we're in the wrong bucket. We affectionately call that the fuck bucket of volatility, for those of you that do want the uncensored version. It's a little bit like the HBO. We've gone away from being the SPN of finance, more like the HBO today. Okay, so that's what it is. But it wasn't. Once you pull back from the high 20s, you know, the VIX, uh, I have it going back towards 15. And that's why I said from Monday's closing price, the upside in the S&P 500 is at least 5 to 9%. So take your 20% correction, put it in your pipe, and smoke it, all right? The other thing to look at is implied vol. Most of you that have never seen this before are like, oh my God, those are too many numbers. I'd rather listen to some partisan hack tell me about the valuation of the market. Okay, whatever. Look, what we want you to do is get smart. 
Use math instead of partisan politics, words, or narratives. Now, that number on SPY on Monday night went to 104% implied vol premium. If you don't know what that means, just a shortcut on that. That means people are panicking and puking buying puts. Today, that number is almost half that. It's 55% on, on SPYs. It's 54% on Qs. So again, you rarely get a triple-digit implied vol premium, A, with a similar set that is B, the market at the low end of the range. If you sold at that level, you may have, you, heck, you may have stolen our quad map. You may have stolen our entire process, but you don't even know how to use it. Isn't that crazy? It's like stealing somebody's car and you don't know how to drive stick shift. You're like, oh, fuck, I can't even move here. Uh, anyway, 10-year uh, yield, what else is going on? It's just kind of like a release, right? Just think about it. On Friday of last week, on the show, we said the, 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 the probability of quad two coming back in Q4 is rising. That was purely data. Monday was a one-off. It was, again, that was not a contagion signal. It was a buy the damn dip signal. By Thursday, the quad two signal continues to rise. Quad two is when you have both growth and inflation rising at the same time. Again, you can borrow it, you can steal it, you can just use it because you're on our team, uh, but that is quad two. Quad two is when interest rates go up, small caps go up, high short interest stocks go up, gold goes down, and utilities do too, right? So on Monday, actually our view from the bond market was to sell gold, get out of utilities and do all that. You know, I haven't gotten bullish enough positionally uh, on quad two yet, but I can go there. Small caps, I'm not long. For example, you know, we like some small cap stocks, but I'm not long the Russell. I just got so bloody well long the NASDAQ and spies on Monday morning that I didn't have any room, right? So again, I gotta make room for small caps. If the probability continues to rise, by the way, we have a 118 slide deck of content that is purely mathematical and time series driven that is gonna be at 11 o'clock if you want the deep dive on that. Those are your top three things, all right? We also, instead of reading uh, old wall media bullshit or listening to that guy from NPR yesterday call everyone that's listening here, the lay people, he prefaced Powell's qu his question on inflation. Can we explain to the lay people that think that there's inflation why there isn't? If I'm the lay person, Jonesy's getting late, all right? <laughs> you know, this is such an opportunity in, in terms of American history where people are so polarized politically. I'm not a Republican, I'm not a Democrat, I'm a Canadian. And what I say to all those political hacks is right there, okay? Narrative economics, great book by one of the great professors I had at Yale. And again, yes, I had the lowest SAT score at Yale. Yes, I'm not the intellectual. But yes, you can trust me because I'm transparent and accountable on, about an actual process that's driven by data. It's driven by data. It's not driven by politics or an opinion on what the market should do. Oh, it should correct 10 to 12% based on my valuation model. That's a pure hack opinion. That has nothing to do with what the market, the price, volume and volatility of the market is actually doing within the lens of the highly probable and rising economic quad or economic outcome. Very different, very different. And if you didn't get all that all at the same time, go to Hedge Eye University, study it. I think you're gonna like what you see if only because it opens your eyes to a better way. And maybe if you say it's not a better way, it certainly is gonna open your eyes. You don't wanna go throughout life as a partisan in markets. That is gonna crush your returns relative to the alternative. All right, I had to get that off my chest for some of you that have never watched. And I know some of you hate me. That makes it even better, yeah, because you just had to listen to that. All right, let's go. What we do next is we take a run around the notebook in terms of all these models. All of our predictive tracking algorithms, all of our nowcasts, all the math gets updated. And what I'm trying to do is write it down, showing you that I study it deliberately because that's how you learn, okay? So again, S&P 500 risk range, I'll write it down every day, 43.35. So that's a big higher low. Big, higher lows are bullish within bullish trends. And the top end of the range is still signaling higher all-time highs. 45, 41, if and when the S&P closes there or higher, would be an all-time high. There is no more bullish setup than that. So again, if you couldn't do it because you were emotionally triggered on, on Monday, this is a much better way to do this. It was obvious. It, it gets almost like in the last 22 years of trading markets, that was top 10 most obvious buy signals. You know, all time's a long time, too. So again, just keep your eyes on your fries there. I do have an all-time high in, in your risk range product. For those of you that subscribe to that, uh, you can see the NASDAQ's also implying a higher all-time high. The Russell has gone neutral, which means on the open, it's most likely to go back to bullish trend. And again, the street is positioned against it. When people tell you everybody's bullish, 
Bullshit. All right. The, the positioning of the market is bearish. Don't, 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 don't. Don't listen to what people say. Watch what they do. I was either buying, I went to no shorts on Monday, completely naked. You tried doing that as an aging Irishman. And I had to show it to everyone. I'm okay with that. 16, like I had only longs. Yeah, naked longs. Yeah, but look at the street. Gender, I've shown the positioning of the market. This is the futures and options position. So when you take all the hedge funds in the aggregate, all the, you know, the pizza buying options traders or whatever, that's the summary of it. I put green arrows on it because people are net short the U.S. stock market and the Russell. So again, that makes the case uh, to go bullish, which I want to do it because I like to buy things on pullbacks, not not after they bounce. Um, that's something to be thinking about there. What we also study is the volume, as I said. It's not just the price, it's the volume of volatility. If you're still chasing 50-day moving monkeys, you just learn for the upteenth time why I call them monkeys. Friday's headline, into the close, was that the S&P 500 has broken the 50-day moving monkey. What the hell did that do for you? On decelerating volume, I might add, the day after that quad witching day was on Friday. Look what the volume did on the up move. It exploded to the upside. Now, again, if you went to bed at night not knowing that, that's okay, because by the morning when I read all of our data sets, I was like, hmm, that's one of the most bullish days we've seen in this bull market, and we've been riding it for quite some time here. So again, that is it's an explosion of volume with volatility failing at the wrong bucket of volatility level, which is right around 31. So again, now you could easily go back into the investable bucket of volatility, which is a volatility index on front month that falls below 20 and can go to 15, it can go to 12, it can go to 10. You know where bull markets end? Not on some guy's valuation opinion. They end at 10 VIX. Look it up. I know you're looking. Good. Our, our relationship's improving. For those of you that, again, we make it free, so some of you have to watch me. Uh, they say that 40% of people that listen to Howard Stern fucking hate him. Is that right? That's a fascinating stat. Of greater than 50% of people that listen to Rush Limbaugh hate him. I'm going for 10. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Keep going here. What else we got? Uh, look at the sector study. So when you look inside the market, don't give me some bullshit about your return because you picked the right sectors. If you were long utilities yesterday and consumer staples, you're in the wrong sectors. If you're long tech, energy, and REITs, which are now the top three sectors in terms of signal strength, every day those change, but they rarely change. Um, you know, tech's been consistently the number one going back to when Quad 2 started, or at least Quad 3 actually that we had in Q3. Don't forget, that the way that that works functionally when you look at Q3, uh, slide, uh, slide 13 in the current macro deck, guys, we'll give you this at least this one now cast update, which will be the premium content uh, uh, later at 11 o'clock. You know, yeah, GDP went from 12 towards 6. GDP slowed. That's called Quad 3 stagflation. Our whole point here is front running our own model. The probability continues to go up that the fourth quarter accelerates versus the third quarter as you reopen the economy, inventories are released. We're going to go through this. This is a beautiful mathematical exercise in probability, and I love it. Uh, what else? We look at cross asset class fall. Okay, what is, what is that? You got to look it up. We can't waste any time on the basics. Uh, for, uh, 280, so we circle the number. That's almost a new cycle low for high yield spreads. So if you woke up with some real intellectually sounding dude on NPR or somebody at Bloomberg with a bow tie saying, oh, if you look at the high yield markets, They've been bloated forever, but you know what high yield and junk bonds do in quad two? They go up. Doesn't matter how much of it there is. Right? And they just went up, right? Bond yields went up. High yield spreads went down, so the bonds went up. That's called anti-contagion signal. The other day we published, we have a systemic you know, contagion trend tracker that you can look at bloody well every day if you want to stare at it, if you're really worried about contagion. Who built their firm based on a contagion call in 2008? Chubby Irish guy. Younger man. Yeah. But we did. We did. It's not like we're you know, Pollyannas here sitting here. Is that how you say that? Pollyanna? Yeah, Pollyanna. Pollyanna. Is it ever grand or ever grande? We haven't figured that one out yet. I'm not sure it matters right now. Mm, yeah, I don't think so either. I think you're right. All right, Asia already gave you the wrap on that. Europe still looks good. Uh, two of our favorites are up over a percent this morning, which include uh, Germany and Switzerland. I will re-rank uh, on the uh, macro themes presentation our European longs in terms of signal strength. Uh, I will also give you the top six 
EM longs that we have now. Some one I alluded to already, which is Thailand. I'm not going to give you everything else. Actually, I will. Israel. There's two of the six. EIS is the ETF for that. 0.7% upside uh, this morning. It's up 3.4% in the last month. So whether it's India up almost 8.5% uh, in the last month or it's Israel up, you know, what it's up, which is 3.5% in the last month, that's not a contagion. That's anti-contagion. Because those two economies are in quad one. Quad one is called Goldilocks. Obviously, you heard that here first. Uh, if anybody else wants to call it that, you know, that's fine. Uh, but the fact of the matter is it's really not. And, and what you really want to do is you want to just be long of quad one. Okay, so quad one, when you find them in those uh, countries, obviously we have those. We'll review that as well. How about the Norwegians this morning? Look at that flag. It's a great flag. Uh, I'm not Norwegian. Uh, obviously, I'm Canadian. I'm Irish, etc. Uh, but that flag, again, think of the debate in the U.S. Oh, my God, we can never raise interest rates or stocks going to go down. Well, Norway, I put all caps, raise rates, and stocks went up 1.3%, remain in bullish trend. By the way, uh, when we've been bullish on quad one or two, uh, and, and, and rates were rising in 2013 quad two, 2017 quad two. Um, again, rates went up and stocks went up. You know, the Fed can get tighter in that environment. If they get tighter and they're too late into quad four by Q2 of next year, that's going to be a big problem. But if the Fed gets a little bit more hawkish from here, they're going to be talking about more hawkish jobs reports, better economic data. That's good, okay? That's a good thing. We know what's bad. We know what's good. And again, it's about things getting better or worse. It's not actually specific valuation points on good we're bad, and we're bad, right? Uh, what else we got? Uh, still like Russia. Uh, that's not a new emerging market idea. That's up 6.2% in the last month. Uh, commodities, look at this chart. Now, a couple questions for you, because some of you are new to this, or you're watching it because it's free and you don't like me. Uh, you like the deflationistas. You're long gold and you're saying that uh, deflation's coming. Well, you just got your ass kicked. Like, again, and again, you know, we say that. You ever watch Miracle? That is off 1.7% from its cycle high, Mike. That's not mid-cycle, early cycle. That's going towards cycle peak, all right? Peak cycle, J peak, wherever you want to go. Have a good time. If you're long, you're going to afford J peak. Wherever you want to go. Go to Whistler. Go somewhere with profits. You know, the, the whole concept that we don't have trending inflation, again, is unqualified bullshit. And the other thing is that we've been long it since June of last year, Okay. So we don't nail things all the time like that because those are hard to nail. They, they you know, cycles bottom and peak, you know, over time. They don't just do it every day because the media is ranting and raving about whatever the hell it is that they're ranting and raving about, trying to get you, you know, to hit their clickbait. Uh, anyway, I digress. Oil, high or low? That's so beautiful. If you're long oil and you see the low end of the range on oil, WTI is now 69.01. Beautiful. That's what you want. Oil volatility, again, anti-contagion risk signal, breaking towards uh, lower lows. Who looks at oil volatility? We do. Pros do. Do you think Joe Kernan looks at it? I mean, could, you know, God help him. Uh, what else do we, or people that follow that? Uh, I've said that enough. Copper doesn't confirm that, but the Chinese are you know, selling shitloads of copper. You know, it would have to get above 430 per pound for copper to break out again. It could happen. So you're saying there's a chance? Absolutely there's a chance. Lumber's up 26% in a month. Crickets. Crickets. Haven't heard one deflation needs to talk about it for a month. That's really objective. Uh, what else we got? Uh, 128 to 140 is the 10-year yield risk range. So it's not just that the 10-year yield is broken out above trend, so it's greater than trend. Trend breakouts in the 10-year yield happen in quad two. That was our call in November. Interest rates are going to break out to the upside. That's before interest rates went to the new cycle highs. And they corrected. Now the low end of the range is 128 which is just inside of the trend. So you're saying there's a chance. There could be another day like we had on Monday. Of course there is. But the probability continues to rise that there, these higher lows in the 10-year yield go higher. So I got the top end of the range towards 140, which looks like it could get there easily by tomorrow. And then you could see a breakout towards 150, 155. Can you get back to the prior cycle highs in quad two that we saw, like the year-to-date highs in the 10-year yield? Absolutely. Is Wall Street positioned for that? Absolutely not. Wall Street is positioned back to CFTC futures and options positioning. They're long duration, i.e. they're long deflation, which means they're short commodities. Uh, and they're, you know, they're, they're short dollars, or they're long dollars, and we're short dollars. So stay with that. Uh, dollar down this morning, of course, rate right off the top end of the range. Some people were like, oh my God, it went up yesterday. Then it went down. Oh my God. Oh my God. Look at that chart. Uh, what else we got? Uh, Bitcoin bounces like a boss rate right off the loan of the range. Ethereum looks better in signal strength terms. We still like that. And I'll take some questions. Okay. Number one question, we discussed this on the call. Um, I was actually writing the early look, so I wasn't totally tuned in, but this is from Fed. Fred, sorry. Is it on Facebook? 
Yep. Oh, yeah. there you go. Well, the way that the macro show works is it, the number one question, because it gets votes, is generally about what didn't work the day prior. Yep. Facebook volatility increased, wider range, still bullish. Do we ignore the narrative and buy at the low end of the range? Yes, yes. And listen to the call. Uh, there's at least five minutes of uh, Andrew Friedman and I going back and forth on that. For those, those of you that don't know what the call is, the call is the morning research meeting at Hedge Eye. It's the only call morning research meeting you can listen to on, on Wall Street, never mind the best one, if everyone had to show their call. Now, a big thing I'm big on is showing what you do, being transparent and accountable to it. When I wrote Diary of a Hedge Fund Manager, you know, the opening premise of the book is to, to, to the profession. What is it that you do? Well, now we know that a lot of hedge funds traded on inside information. We've always known that, but big ones blew up on that. You know, we, we also know that people have no process. They, they ride bull markets and blow up in bears. Uh, you know, people can't go both ways. But the call is a very good product because it helps you learn to play the game at the highest level as opposed to the clown show you see on CNBC. Yeah, actually, we may, uh, I'll see if we can put up the clip of that, too, because I thought it was a really interesting discussion, you talking about what you're seeing, and yeah. you're talking about what he's seeing. In the risk range today, you see, you know, top end of the range, a little bit more volatility in a, in a bullish trend gives you more upside. So there's a higher high now of 390 on, on FB, which is great. Okay, uh, this is from DM. Ever, ever buy something like XLP, despite it being in the wrong quad? But with an eyeball premium and eye watering, two hundred and fourteen percent with a Z score of uh, three point six. Yeah, I cover. You know, that's called covering some shorts. Yeah, um, yeah so I don't do when, when it gets. <laughs> yeah, when it sort of gets that stretched. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, consumer staples have been miserable. Um, they were supposed to be defensive. Um, you know, Mike's long defensive, and uh, yeah, I'm short defensive. So. I'm short melting ice cubes like Telecom. I think he likes that. He likes consumer stable. So I'm short like Clorox, Campbell Soup, Verizon. These are all my PA, my personal account shorts. They've been awesome. So I sit there and I watch these shorts perform. And of course, when they go straight down, like Clorox did again yesterday, you cover some shorts. Implied ball premiums explode when people are like, oh my God, it's breaking to lower lows. That's typically when people have to buy protection is obviously when they see things going down. So that's why you see that on that implied vol table. That's a, that's a power user of the process noticing a particular. So again, it's not the average or the moving monkey average of things in macro that matters. It's understanding the particular thing at the particular time. So again, a good call out by uh, that subscriber there. MP from Colts Neck. Is it not very likely? Where's Colts Neck? Uh, New Jersey, oh, cool. I believe. Um, is it not very likely that the brief sojourn into shallow quad two in Q4 will be superseded by the need to prepare for a steep quad four in early 2020? So not very likely. Um, so we is want to it, clean up with that question a bit. There's no such thing as steep quad four. It's called deep quad four. Um, if you look at the current map, um, you know, look at the quad map slide six, you can see that the quad four and Q2 of 2020 call, which is a couple careers now away from me, but it bears, bears really want to talk about that. Now, you're going to get your ass kicked by not understanding all the moves you need to make in between that. It's kind of like meeting up with a bear in, a, in, the, in the forest. You, know, you knew he was there, but it's, it's that particular moment in time when he's like right there. You, know? you either have a gun or you don't. You either have a friend there that you can outrun or you don't. Uh, <laughs> kidding. You know, we're not morbid. But again, my job, I gave you the quads. We invented the quads, and it is my job to get you through the, what I think is going to be the mother of all time highs. We already made that call like every other day uh, for the last nine months, or actually going on longer than that now. Um, I'll be there. And yeah, you know, I, I, I think I'll go, I'll go through this in the macro uh, pro presentation at 11. This is what it's going to look like. This is a very technical chart. So for those of you that are new to investing, this might, this might confuse you. But, um, um, so this, and, it, and I'm, not, I'm not trying to, you know, I'm not trying to talk down to people. I'm trying to teach people. Right? So the chart on the S&P 500 and NASDAQ, which is like this, is going to go like this. You are here. Now, by the time we get to there, give me three to six months of time and space. I'll start giving you some, like, what the market gives me, or not. May or may not happen. You know, you call somebody on your, your, the old wall, and they're going to tell you with no timing that that's going to happen, with no quads. Then, when you hit quad four, from the highest level you've ever seen, you're going to have something like that. Very technical outlook. I, I didn't want to go too high level there, but that, that's, that's what I'm thinking. 
And don't if you put on the other position on Monday, like some people did, you just reminded yourself why playing at the highest level is not easy. If you want to go to that, you want to put on quad four, you just got smoked. Especially if you're an institutional investor. Of course, if you, you know, if you, at, when the 10-year yield was at, one, at the low end of my range, 128 or whatever, uh, if you bought a bunch of treasuries and a bunch of gold, I mean, you shouldn't be doing macro. No. You won't be doing it institutionally, at least. Okay, this is uh, from Daniel John. Bitcoin's volatility is at 94th percentile of three months realized. Until this number decreases, should, does this add an additional el- element of risk to holding a Bitcoin position? Love your work, boys. Yeah, there's always tons of risk. I mean, you're, so you're saying there's some risk on something that has trending volatility like in the 50s and 60s. <laughs> yeah. Always. I mean, that, that is Bitcoin. Uh, by the way, Bitcoin's going to get eviscerated in Quad 4. Um, but I'm along it now because Bitcoin showed the... I don't know if we have the back test available. Uh, in the crypto trend tracker product, we show the back test on Bitcoin against the quads, on ETH, Ethereum against the quads. And again, you, you want to be you know, very long of Bitcoin and or Ethereum in Quad 3 uh, and or Quad 2. So we're in the right quadrant. The trend signal held. That's enough for me. It went to the low end of the range. It probed there. It had a lot of people frustrated and sell there. Uh, that's where you, I, I suppose for you hodlers, that's where you would uh, buy more. Okay. Uh, bear with me for a second here. Okay. Yeah, I've had a few questions with on the this. Bigger, oh, with sorry. the bigger audience, because we have like I mean, a bunch of people that have never seen this before. Is there kind of like a question in there that's been moving up um, that, that you've never seen before? Because there could be, I mean, that's what I love about Hedge Eye Nation. I mean, I'd much rather take a question from the people than a bunch of asshats like the Fed had yesterday asking them questions. Mm. Couldn't believe that guy called people the lay people. But then I did. I was like, I looked him up. He's like, a, no offense to that kind of a Harvard guy uh, or a Yale guy or a Princeton guy or a gal for that matter. It's, it's, it's the intellect, right? The older baby boomer intellect speaking down to people, you know, I, you know, I am the head of NPR economics, therefore. I mean, come on, dude. Okay. Um, this this question on the Russell, and you talked about this a little bit on the call as well, uh, from Michael B. Last month, and I think it's a bit of a teaching question, but last month when RVX, which is Russell volatility, was, was 25, it was a red flag when Vixen was 20, but now RVX is 27 and a half and Vixen is 23. You were looking for bullish quad two you know, in, in Q4. Why are you bullish now even though volatility is higher? Well, I, th- I think the main problem with that question, there's nothing wrong with the question in terms of like calling out all the particular points that you said. You're really, you're really dealing in level space, whereas I'm dealing with the rate of change. So again, the rate of change today on Russell volatility is far more important than the level being higher than the prior level. All right, It's not in the wrong bucket. Let's start with that. So when you have volatility, you have three buckets of volatility. Okay, Let's maybe, guys, uh, how much, we got uh, three minutes here. I actually think that this is a lesson that everybody should have in their life for free anyway. So let's just take the rest of the show and explain how to look at markets on a volatility adjusted basis using the three buckets of volatility that only Hedgeye has defined within the lens of our quad process and the signaling process, okay? There are three buckets of volatility for for you to think about, okay? And we'll use the VIX as an example, but I I will come back to to the Russell, which uh, RVX, which is equivalent to the VIX for the Russell, and and, and well put um, by our subscriber on that. So we have, um, let's, let's color the buckets so that you understand, okay? And we're talking about, we're gonna use the VIX. The VIX, the investable level, uh, investable range and levels of volatility, levels within the range. Uh, for the VIX, let's call it 10 to 19. Anytime the VIX is oscillating in between there, can't get above 19, keeps plowing to lower lows, every bull market's ended at 10 VIX or lower. You know, there's actually one sniff at nine. So that's called the investable bucket of volatility. That's when the pizza guy in Boston who's giving you ratings on that and stocks even looks smart, okay? Easy, really easy. Yeah, we can all do it. Actually, I, I, I wish for the people that we're always in uh, quad one or two with the VIX in the investable bucket of volatility. Okay, just think of volatility. Volatility is the number one thing that will drive fear. You know, your amygdala is triggered. You're you're panicking. You're puking. You're looking for political reasons. All right. Okay. So you come out of that bucket, and then you get into what we call the chop bucket. So this is actually where I live. I love the chop bucket. So this is a chop bucket. Chop. Hashtag chop. Uh, where you're basically greater than twenty and rising towards 30. But when you go back and forth in that bucket, like that, 
Let's give you a little bit more as opposed to being, you know, let's, let's use my girlfriend, Pink, one of my favorites. She's a beauty. Um, you know, you're back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. You can make a lot of money as, as a trader. I know some people call me that as like, a, like as an insult. I love trading. Uh, that's, you know, good market to trade because you're all, every time you go to the top end of the range in the VIX, oh, and then at the low end of the range, oh. You don't want to feel any of that. This isn't riding a roller coaster. You're not 12 years old, or at least most of you aren't. The chop is really good in a bull market that's got people trying to, trying to call tops, trying to call tops, trying to scare the shit out of you, trying to make money on clickbait, whatever. Then we have this very, um, you know, for those of you uh, that know this, you can wait on it. So this is called the fuck bucket of volatility, right? So this is when you go greater than 30 volatility and you stay there. And you stay there, and you stay there, and you stay there. That's like the ro roller coaster that doesn't go off the top. It's the one that breaks and everybody dies. And I've made that call a lot. So again, it's within the lens of quad four, economically pending. That's what the market is front running when volatility, as opposed to in here, is episodic and non-trending. Greater than 30 and staying at 30 is episodic not and trending. When oil volatility went to 320, never mind 32, the oil price went negative. That was the most volatility any major asset has had ever. You know, Bitcoin may get there at some point. I don't know if it's going to go to zero. <laughs> but these are the, the, this is how you should think about fading yourself. Think of all, all the issues I have. Clearly, if you love me or hate me, you can see those. I'm human, right? But I've found a damn good way to fade, you know, to fade my feelings. Fade the idea that I know more than the market. Fade the concept that there's some intellectual base to this. No, it's actually, from a practitioner's perspective, a lot like professional sports. The greatest enemy to you making money is yourself. In sports, I coach it this way. It's your ticker. You can have all the talent in the world. And most people that went to schools like Jonesy and I did, I, at least on paper they do, and they have number two as well, which is intelligence. On paper, absolutely. Some of the smartest people I've ever seen on paper are some of the worst traders, risk managers, investors you'll ever see in your life. Right? Because the next ones, compete and resilience, are what define somebody who can play at the highest level. Somebody who can take a punch. Somebody who can take criticism. Somebody who can be coached by somebody like me and like it. All right? So again, once you get into these periods, like, are you going to be resilient? Do you have the process to understand we just went to the top end of the range in the chop bucket and we backed off? So just to come back to this full circle on your RVX question, because it, got, it went out at 27 yesterday. Well, what happens if it's going back towards 20 and drops into this bucket? That would be defined by rising probability of quad two. So it's not about 27 being higher than the number you saw when I said what I said the day before. It has nothing to do with what I said the day before. This isn't an audit by an intellectual. You're, if you want to audit me intellectual, have at it. But I'm going to keep moving because the game is all about playing the next game, setting up for tomorrow. It's not going back and saying, well, if I look at the prior valuation of this market, the typical, you know, the average decline was this. You know, that, is, that is so, so old wall. So old wall. We are stochastic. We believe in nonlinearity. We believe in jump factors, jump conditions, just like in the world. Do you ever see an avalanche, a hurricane? Imagine you were... Uh, most people that do this uh, professionally at Morgan Stanley or wherever, one of my main competitors, got a lot of respect for Mike, Mike Wilson. I can't understand how, he, he, how he's coming up with this stuff, type of thing. The only thing worse than making a 10 to 12% correction is stepping on it when it's below your 50-day moving monkey on Monday saying it should be 20. And then, and then it going, you know, Evergrande going up 32% a day. Again, it's not critical. It's just holding to, to account a process that doesn't work. So again, saying that the average of things, moving average of things, the average correction in things, the average valuation of things, that is the opposite of what Benoit Mandelbrot taught us in fractal math. The opposite. It's a particular thing that happens at the particular time that gives you points of entropy, breakouts, jump conditions, et cetera. All right? And if you get that, they're beautiful both ways. I love the fuck bucket. I want it, but I don't. People get unemployed in the fuck bucket. I don't want that, but I want it because I'm going to make money when people lose money. I want this because everybody wins. But when everybody wins, I have to deal with CNBC coming back to life. And it's like, thank you for listening. <laughs> right, we're wrapping up there. Once again, macro themes presentation. Today at 11, email support at hedgeye.com. 
if you want to learn how to get access. Thanks.